beauty. By golly, I think I'll buy a new car. Three o'clock, boss. Time to go home. <laughs> I've never eaten anything so fattening in my entire life. Freeway southbound's not moving, well, it's moving about five miles an hour. Fast lane taken up by that three car nine injury wreck. Look for the usual slow crawl through the Pomona Valley. We start out on the 60 to the 10, but we start from 10 to the 210, and we go from the 210 to the 134, and from the 134, we get on the 5. We spend an average of four hours a day. It's dark when we leave, and it's dark when we come home. We walk in the door, it's dark. We really be together more than our own family. I mean, for me, I be with them more than I be with my own family. A multi-car crash blocking the fast lane. Southbound PCH, still a struggle from Topanga to Sunset. In Orange County, we got a problem with the 605 at Catella. <laughs> This is a story about how things got the way they are. Why sitting in stalled traffic seems perfectly natural. Why our public transportation is the worst in the industrialized world. And why superhighways cut right through the hearts of our cities. This is a story about how the auto and highway industries reshaped America. Brad Snell has made a career researching the auto industry. He spends much of his time here working on a book about General Motors. How long have you been working on this project? Um, I hate to admit it, but I've been working on it for 16 years. Why so much time on one book? Because General Motors is the largest corporation in the world. It has sales of $125 billion a year. It has operations in 104 countries. If it were regarded as a country, if you looked at its sales and you compared those with, say, revenues that countries ordinarily would receive, it would be the sixth largest uh, country in the world. And yet there's no history. public transportation in America, for the first part of the century, you're talking about streetcars. Trolleys ran on most major avenues every few minutes. Steel track and quiet electric motors made the ride smooth and clean and comfortable. The center of the road was reserved for streetcars, and the new automobiles had to move out of the way. In 1922, only one American in ten owned an automobile. Everyone except for the one in ten who owned an automobile uh, used rail. At that time, Alfred P. Sloan said, wait a minute, this is a great opportunity. I mean, we've, we've got 90% of the market out there that we can somehow turn into automobile users. If we can eliminate the rail alternatives, we will create a new market for our cars. And if we don't, then this whole, you know, the entire General Motors sales are just going to be, are going to be lovely. They had to get rid of the streetcars. They wanted the space that the streetcars used for automobiles. They had to find something they could put in place of the streetcar. 
Sloan had the concept that he wanted to somehow motorize all the major cities of the country. That meant uh, replacing all the street railways with buses. And ultimately, thinking that no one would want to ride the buses and therefore they'd buy General Motors automobiles. Sloan wanted to get in very big in this field. What he bought was phenomenal. The largest bus operating company in the country and the largest bus production company. And using that as a foothold, GM moved into Manhattan. They acquired interest in the New York railways, and between 1926 and 1936, they methodically destroyed the rails. When they finally motorized New York, General Motors issued these, these ads throughout the country, and this is important because they're trying to show that motorization is the wave of the future. They issued these ads and it said, the motorization of Fourth and Madison is the most important and epical event in the history of community transportation. In the mid-1930s, GM worked hard to create the impression of a nationwide trend away from rail. But there was no trend. Buses were a tough sell. They jolted, they smelled, they inched through traffic. City by city, it took the hidden hand of General Motors to replace streetcars with yellow coach buses. In 1936, the company was founded that would grow to dominate American city transportation. National City Lines had no visible connection to General Motors. In fact, the director of operations came from a GM subsidiary, Yellow Coach, and members of the board came from Greyhound, which was founded and controlled by General Motors. The money to start this new company also came from Greyhound and Yellow Coach. To hide these connections, the company needed a front man. Roy Fitzgerald got his start in northern Minnesota, where he hauled minors and school children in a couple of buses. General Motors would groom him to become president of National City Lines. Over the next few years, Standard Oil of California, Mack Truck, Phillips Petroleum, and Firestone Tire would join GM in backing this venture. All of a sudden, you get these fellows with the fedora hats, the spats. I'm not making that up. Uh, the two-tone shoes, the broad ties, the black shirts, the white Panamas. All of a sudden, they show up. And, of course, the word goes out, hey, we're being bought. Fitzgerald, big name in buses. National City now in top place as operator of City Route Miles. Prime mover is E. Roy Fitzgerald, who describes himself as one of five farm boys trying to run a few buses. The Fitzgeralds came in here just like they did in every city they ever went into. They destroyed an established public transit system that had been built to meet the needs of the people. So the streetcars, we love riding on them. And it was fun because they were big, you know, there was plenty of room and all that. We'd catch them at the same time every day. We'd know the, same, the conductor and you'd meet people that you'd see every day. And you weren't afraid to, to talk to someone. The streetcar was fast. It, it just jumped on chairs like that. It was so fast. And then the conductor, every time he would come to a crossing, he'd go clink, 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 clink. For the trolley cars yourself? Oh, yeah, J-Car, yeah. yeah. I was here. <laughs> they were around when we were, when we were younger. <laughs> that was the best form of transportation. Then somebody had the bright idea to take up all the track and get rid of all the trolleys. That's when the headache started. How long did it take before the Fitzgerald started getting rid of the streetcar? Uh, about 90 days. No, I'm, I'm not being facetious about that. 
weren't those streetcars making money in Los Angeles? Well, after I got done chopping their heads off, we made money. Cut the miles down. Sell off the properties. Pull the company down. They don't take the service out. They just cut it back. They'll take it and they'll cut it from 10 minutes to 12 minutes, from 12 to 15, from 15 to 20, from 20 to 30. So they reduce the service. And every time you reduce the service, you make it less attractive. And the less attractive, the less riders. And then they say, well, see, we can't make any money. So they abandoned it. People told me you went in there and you fired everyone off when you went there. Yeah, that's right. Why'd you do that? Well, if you don't need the people, what are you going to do? Keep them around for flies? There was people on there who was up for retirement. And you always get rid of the old ones first. Yeah, that's what we do. Barney and Eric was just like everybody else of that particular ilk. All they were interested in doing was taking the money out. They sucked the system dry. They raised the fares. They skimmed every dime's worth of everything they could get off of it. Basically, I'm bitter of what I've seen. Because if you take a fine tool Rolls Royce as an example, and give it to some shade tree mechanic and let him work on it, and he ruins it. You're going to be bitter about your rules. And that's what we had, was we had a Rolls Royce. We had the finest public transportation system in law, I think, of anywhere in the country. And in 10 years, that was just history. National city lines grew quickly. By 1946, they controlled public transit systems in over 83 cities. From Baltimore to St. Louis, Salt Lake City to LA, two buses in Eveleth, Minnesota had grown into an empire. The appearance was always that this was only a company that was owned by the Fitzgeralds. You know, these people that had come from Minnesota with no money at all, and all of a sudden they're in control of this, you know, multi-million dollar <laughs> enterprise. But in fact, money was coming from the corporate sponsors. To the mayor, to the city manager, to the city transit engineer, and to the taxpayers and the riding citizens of your city, you are entitled to this warning. There is a carefully, deliberately planned campaign to swindle you out of your electric railway system. Commander Edwin Quinby was a rail buff with a talent for financial sleuthing. In 1946, he mailed a warning to influential people in hundreds of cities across the country. His 33-page broadside was filled with surprisingly detailed research. It brought to light what General Motors had worked hard to hide. The plan is to deliberately destroy public utilities which you will find impractical to replace after you discover your mistake. Who are the corporations behind this? What is more important, why are they permitted to destroy valuable electric railways? Queer Case of Quinby by Ross Schramm. Edwin J. Quinby took full advantage of the great American privilege of the free press to feed the lunatic fringe of radicals and crackpots springing up like weeds in the United States today. The document, printed on cheap paper, is natural fertilizer for suspicions, for disunity. What is the Quinby pattern? Was he used by some strange political influence? Edwin Quinby's efforts did not stop National City Lines, but the cat was out of the bag. In 1946, the Justice Department began an antitrust investigation into National City Lines, General Motors, and the other investors. It appears that National City Lines and its manufacturing associates have entered into a plan to secure control over local transportation in important cities in the United States. 
If these companies are permitted to continue their program, they will soon have a stranglehold over the industry. The key lawyers involved in the case told me there is not a scintilla of doubt that these defendants, General Motors and the others, had set out to destroy the streetcar system. But since there was no antitrust law on the books at that point saying thou shalt not destroy streetcar systems, that the best way, the only way that they could get them on a, on a violation was to proceed along the, uh, the criminal antitrust uh, conspiracy route. And that's what they did. The government's case was straightforward. National City Lines, General Motors, and the other defendants were found guilty of conspiracy to monopolize the local transportation field. These companies that had probably eliminated systems that in order to reconstitute today would require maybe $300 billion, these companies were individually fined $5,000. And the uh, individuals involved, like the treasurer of General Motors, who had actively run Pacific City Lines, one of the subsidiaries, and it was a major moving factor in all of National City Lines operations, he was fined the magnanimous sum of one dollar at the conclusion of the trial. The Justice Department would spend the next 25 years trying to limit GM's influence on transportation. It would begin three major investigations into monopoly practices. Two were settled out of court. One was eventually dropped. An effective way to rein in General Motors was never found. Things are looking up for civilian car buyers, but don't rush out to get one now. This sample will not go into production for two or three months. When Detroit overnight... The post-war years were an auto executive's dream. After 15 years of depression and war, returning GIs had money in their pockets and they were eager to get on the flight. Federally subsidized mortgages favoring new homes encouraged an exodus from city to suburb. These are the 36 men who built this house. Another day, another 40 houses. And, of course, every new suburban home needed a brand new automobile. But the cities were at a crossroads. During the war, despite the efforts of national city lines, streetcar ridership reached an all-time high. Factories ran round the clock, and so did the streetcars. This heavy use left track worn to the nub and trolleys worn out. It was a moment of choice. Rebuild the trolley lines or watch them die. Europe and Japan rebuilt, but America's privately owned transit companies resisted such a costly investment. There was public pressure for cities to take over and bring the rail systems up to date. But by now, National City Lines was a model for a cheap and easy way out. Across the country, private operators followed its lead. Elimination of the big red cars and substitution of buses are necessary to keep the railway out of financial hot water. Thirteen of the system's 19 rail lines will have to go. Los Angeles had two streetcar companies, one owned by the Fitzgeralds, and the other, the Pacific Electric Red Cars, that were the pride of L.A. There were hundreds of trains a day, and downtown, a subway. A thousand miles of track linked the beach to the mountains and connected scores of communities to downtown. You say that you used to ride the red cars. Yes, yeah. I rode them every morning, and, uh, and uh, many of us would play bridge or something while we were going down, and uh, they preempted the major intersections, so they were fast. I certainly preferred them to the bus. In fact, when I, as long as it was possible for me, I always rode the cars. The fate of the red cars was front page news for more than a year. The public was outraged. A blistering attack was laid down today by a group of civic leaders. 
Attorney Marshall Stimson told the board, you're not going to solve Los Angeles traffic problems by turning loose hundreds of buses to stink up the air, slow down traffic, and tie up the streets. A survey of San Fernando Valley citizens showed 88% want rail passenger service retained. Pacific Electric needed heavy ammunition to get their plan past the Public Utility Commission, so they brought in Arthur Jenkins. Jenkins had been chief engineer of the commission, and he was highly respected. In the past, he'd supported rail improvement. But in 1946, Jenkins began working with the Fitzgerald brothers. His position quickly changed. There's only one fundamental issue involved, and that is whether or not Pacific Electric should be permitted to follow the course already established throughout the country of replacing obsolete rail passenger service. I remember some of this. Of Do you? I was going to ask if this bring back the memories. <laughs> yes, of, um, it does. It brings back some very interesting recollections. What does it make you remember? Well, it makes me remember that uh, people will say what's very be beneficial to their cause. To what extent did you consider the noxious fumes which would result by the substitution of motor coaches? I gave a good deal of consideration to that. Actually, there is no harmful effects of the fumes, and numerous tests have been made on that account. Some of the buses stunk so bad I couldn't ride them, they made me sick, actually. Do you think the buses did add to the pollution? No, there's no question about it, very dramatically. If you go down, even today, go down in any, any street where there's a bus line and follow a bus and see how long you last. The State Public Utilities Commission yesterday granted the Pacific Electric the right to use buses instead of trolleys on most of its suburban lines. It probably will take three to six months before the big red cars stop rolling. Every street almost in Philadelphia had a trolley line. I don't care whether it was second and third, fourth and fifth. They, the line just went up and down until it got up in the north, and then they would branch out. Every north-south street had tracks, and more than 50% of the east-west streets. There was a change in management. Uh, there was a uh, concerted effort to maximize the use of the bus. Philadelphia was the last big city transit system to face national city lines. The antitrust case had forced GM to sell its stock in National City, but the Fitzgeralds continued to tear out trolleys, and General Motors continued to provide the buses. In keeping with the vigorous spirit of the new Philadelphia, PTC has completed a $36 million modernization program spearheaded by the purchase of 1,000 new diesel motor coaches. A story of diesels and dollars. They come in and they started to cut. And they cut everything in this brother. As the new buses came in, another trolley line went. I think it didn't hit the afternoon paper. One story I heard, the newly appointed vice president handed the superintendent of the department a list and said, these are the people that I want you to fire today. And he brought them in one at a time, told them they were done as of that minute, clean out your desk, leave. When he was all done toward the end of the day, he went back in and he said, okay, here's your list back. They're all fired. And the vice president said, good. Now, you're fired. National City Lines never came in to make the system any better, in far as what I read and for what I know. Their idea was to scrap properties. We sold everything. Almost everything we had is, was now sold. Did you ever consider working for a PTC? No, I didn't consider it. I stopped considering it. I didn't think uh, I would uh, 
I don't want to work for an organization that I don't believe in or can't support. Before the big change, all but six of the city's 30 main downtown arteries were handicapped with streetcar operations. By the end of December 1957, three streetcar surface lines were all that remained in the downtown area, and only 14 in the entire city. They did it in Baltimore, they did it in Philadelphia, they did it in Los Angeles. Come in to do a job. And five gallons of kerosene went with every trolley car. Put a torch to it, and that's the way it went. Now, you stripped everything. They don't have to stay. Once they sell you buses, it'll perpetuate itself. Will you stop honking, Mac? We ain't going nowhere. This is Agony Alley. Morning rush and evening wait. What's a citizen gonna do? Don't honk your horn. Raise your voice. Ask for better highways and more parking space. It's your country. Give yourself the green light. How did General Motors influence highway lobby in Washington? Well, influence, I mean, they, they, they originated it. I mean, in June 1932, uh, Sloan, chairman of General Motors, uh, created something called the National Highway Users Conference. He brought together the oil companies, the tire companies, anyone who had anything to do with the motorized transportation, brought them into this tremendous umbrella group. This became the kernel of what we now know as the highway lobby. They would spend millions and millions of dollars on pushing highways. Now let me say a word about government bureaucracy. Alfred Sloan headed the National Highway Users Conference for 20 years. When he retired, the next GM president took his place. Everyone wanted freeways. At the top of General Motors' agenda was a system that would not only move people between cities, but would also become the main form of travel within them. With an army of paid lobbyists and an unlimited war chest, the highway lobby was by far the most powerful pressure group in Washington. Freedom to travel safely and quickly and comfortably on our highways is not a little freedom, but a big one. People in their own communities are getting together to do something. I'm Helen Rathburn, the fourth grade teacher at the new elementary school. I, I came here today just to listen. I didn't expect to say anything. Uh, but after hearing some of the arguments against the new highway proposal, I would like to say just one thing. I work all day with children, and they're your children. Your children will have a better country to live in because of these new roads. Can't you see that this highway means a whole new way of life for the children? GM also had strong allies inside the White House. In 1953, General Motors President Charles Wilson was appointed Secretary of Defense. There, he pushed for freeways as a vital part of national security. 
That same year, Francis DuPont, whose family owned the largest share of General Motors, became the chief administrator of Federal Highways. Did Francis DuPont play much of a role in terms of working towards the interstate system? He was the key to it. He was the key to it, actually getting it moving. The DuPont name had a great deal of pressure to open a door. He proposed to President Eisenhower that this was a program the nation needed. He immediately got favorable reaction and was told to go ahead. In 1956, after years of promotional films, industry lobbying, and inside influence, Congress passed the largest public works project in history, the Interstate Highway System. About half the money would build freeways in the cities. To pay for the interstates, Congress created the Highway Trust Fund with money from a gasoline tax. This fund could only be used to build highways. More highways meant more driving. More driving meant more taxes, and more taxes would mean more roads. O oh, almighty God, who has given us this earth and has appointed men to have domination over it, who has commanded us to make straight the highways, to lift up the valleys, and to make the mountains low. We ask thy blessing. Bless these, our nation's road builders, and their friends. This is Highway I-93. It is the final eight-lane southern link of an interstate highway. Building the road required the relocation of 4,000 people, 26 businesses, and part of the Mystic River. And the road has a problem. It doesn't work. It would feed four extra lanes of traffic into a three-lane highway on which traffic already backs up two miles during the rush hour. They were building this freeway along the waterfront in San Francisco. But a funny thing happened along the way. The people of San Francisco said they didn't like the new freeway, and they began protesting. They wanted to complete the freeway, which was ran along the Embarcadero Center. And I wouldn't let them. They had to get our permission to close the streets. And Governor Reagan sent uh, Lieutenant Governor Finch down to see me. and said, we'll give you the port, we'll give you everything else there if you let us complete this freeway. I says, forget it. We aren't going to let you complete any freeway along our waterfront. Do what you've done in towns like Boston, Seattle, and places like that. It's going to happen. For the two years that I was at the Federal Highway Administration, it was a drumbeat of uh, citizen uh, unhappiness with urban highway plans. We started in 64, 64. with the Emergency yeah. Committee on the Transportation Crisis in Washington, D.C. This huge freeway, I-95, was going to barrel right through the community I lived in. It was the kind of freeway that actually ended up being almost 26 lanes. It was going to bisect neighborhood after neighborhood and take schools from people, churches from people, universities from people. We have a street called U Street, which was the street for black folks to they was going to run it right straight down, down the middle of that street. So that was how we got practically all the inner city people to join us because we showed their area was going to be uprooted so somebody from outside the city could drive right through. A freeway by Fisherman's Wharf, and then out to the Marina Greens. It looks out to Sausalito. There isn't a view like that anywhere in this world. Just to get over the Golden Gate Bridge. So I told them, look, just tell everybody to slow up in town and enjoy themselves in this beautiful town. They don't have to zip through it. Who was pushing this? I mean, okay, oh, you've got those those the, the, the road plan. builders, the highway the, the, lobby, the highway lobby, the, the, whole the, highway the, lobby. In the cement mixers, the, the uh, road asphalt. builders. Every year, they had a bag of money, and everybody was getting fifty thousand, ten thousand dollars. The chairman was getting that money. The federal it, truck. <laughs> it's not our government. It doesn't belong to us because we haven't paid enough for it. The people who own the government have bought for bought it and paid for it. That highway crowd. If you gave them a chance, they would put a freeway right through the Vatican if they figured by doing it that they would save a little space or save a little mileage. 
We heard from uh, New York, West Side Highway, New Orleans, Nashville, Atlanta was a big fight, Newport, California, Phoenix, and at one point we were putting up people from uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, and while they were in Washington and we were helping them go downtown and plead their case in Congress, their homes were bulldozed that very day. This was a brutal period in our history, a very brutal period. Citizens worked together to stop 17 urban freeways across the country. But most of the highways were built as planned. Sooner or later, the collective mind is going to put this together, and then there is going to be a collective political will, and then it is going to change, and they are going to say, we are not going to fund this foolishness anymore, because it's very foolish. The motor car shapes and forms, mutilates and deforms might be better words. We are exchanging the meaningful and varied life of the city for an increasingly monotonous life on wheels. The choice is clear and urgent. Does the city exist for people or for motor cars? By the mid-60s, the answer was motor cars. Public transit continued its downward spiral. As ridership fell, routes were dropped, property and assets sold off. Finally, local governments bought what was left. They were 15 years too late. For better or for worse, the great American love affair was in full bloom. It's never caught in a traffic jam. Hello, this is Santa Monica Freeway. Austin's pointed to Pastor San Pedro. Ladies and gentlemen, a smog alert is currently in progress. Remain in doors. Please remain in doors. Smog of the season, heavy, oppressive, dirty air hung over the city this 4th of July week. It's particularly difficult for the very old and the young. They seem to only be able to stay outside like maybe 10 minutes at a time. And then they'd have to come inside and rest. To meet federal pollution standards, the Environmental Protection Agency said today that it might be necessary to remove 8 out of every 10 cars from Southern California's highways during the worst smog months. I don't know what it's like to not have a car. You gotta have it, you know, it's a necessity of life. There's not enough uh, public transportation to get you around. By a vote of 215 to 190, the House today rejected a proposal that would allow cities to spend their share of the highway trust fund on buses, subways, and trains instead of on highways. The House, defying reason, voted to block funds for mass transit, which we all need, and pour billions more into highways that only the highway lobby wants. In 1974, with public discontent growing, the Senate Antitrust Committee held hearings about the roots of the transportation crisis. Brad Snell, then only 25, was hired to organize the sessions. And I think the automobile industry is the number one example. 
of monopoly power that has changed, literally changed the quality of our lives. And it has done so, not on the basis of what people really needed, but rather on the basis of serving corporate interests. Was it General Motors that really wrecked the streetcar system in America? The answer has got to be yes, because General Motors actually formed the company to go in to buy out these... General Motors came into a situation where streetcars were inordinately inefficient. They were not flexible. Do you know of any streetcar system that could service San Francisco with all of its uh, outlying communities and suburbs? I am not an anti-automobile nut. I don't want to outlaw the automobile. I'm not suggesting it isn't a convenient way of, of, of traveling. I am suggesting that it must be supplemented by rapid transit systems. And I cannot accept the argument that rapid transit systems broke down because of their complete inefficiency to serve the public because the experience of Western Europe and Japan belies that argument. And finally, Senator, I must say with great deference that if it is true that the streetcar companies were breaking down of their own weight, why was it necessary for General Motors to join with Standard Oil and the tire companies to go in and buy the systems and tear up the tracks? Wholly unfounded accusations have been widely publicized to the damage of General Motors. Street railways failed for economic and demographic reasons, which had nothing to do with any plot. The fact that GM provided a modest amount of financial assistance to national city lines did not have any effect on National City Line's decision to convert from streetcars to buses. The fact remains that here was a breakdown of a, of a system, a mode of transportation, and in came the bus. Now, you can't get away from buses, can you? I'm not trying to get away from buses. Well, Let me emphasize again talk. I thought that you were we, trying to eliminate General Motors and that we, All I want is balance, Senator. And you ought not to treat the automobile with $15 billion a favor a year and treat everything else like an orphan child. What's good for General Motors is not necessarily good for the country. And in the field of transportation, what has been good for General Motors has in fact been very, very bad for the country. For a time after the Senate hearings in 74, public transportation staged a partial comeback. After years of pressure, Congress finally allowed highway trust funds to be used for transit improvements. Several cities canceled highway projects. San Francisco and Washington put the money into new subways. And many cities began developing plans for light rail, the modern term for streetcars. Jack Bors is now a transit engineer. He helps communities build the new systems. When I worked out here as a student, there were trolley tracks right there on Howard Street, and I would sometimes use that particular line. It's one place that I do remember the old trolleys, and now the new one's here. Did you ever think when they tore out the light rail that it would ever come back? I, I felt in the larger cities like Baltimore uh, and some others that uh, there was a good possibility at some time some of the lines would come back. I wasn't sure I would live to see it, but it happened. 25 cities are now experimenting with light rail systems. They cost less than highways, pollute less, and bring new life to city centers but the auto and highway lobby has different ideas about what America needs. America is one of the few countries in the world whose people have always been free to come and go as they please. Now that freedom is being threatened, but what can frustrated drivers do about it? Launch a program- The highway lobby may have lost some of its 1950s luster, but it's still powerful. It has recently pushed through Congress a plan for a second national highway system with four times the miles of the interstates. And in the cities where people just won't allow another lane to be added, the highway lobby has developed a new approach. 
In 1989, the Highway Users Federation formed the Intelligent Vehicle Highway Society. Now, every vehicle can replace older its idea? Automate cars and highways. Computers would control chains of cars traveling 60 miles per hour, bumper to bumper. The hope? Double or even triple the number of cars on the road. This cyber system will require hundreds of new technologies. Jim, this is Sony's uh, new in-vehicle navigation system. It incorporates two different technologies, GPS, which is the global positioning system of satellites, and CD-ROM. Well, what we have here, Jim, is a TRW, electronically controlled electric powered steering unit, or EPS. The ultimate test for any steering system is during parking. It takes about 2,000 pounds, one ton of force, to steer and park a car, but watch this. So the electric powered steering unit is now generating about a thousand pounds to lift Mary. But think about this. Next generation electric powered steering systems could become a key component for hands-off steering as part of the automated highway systems of tomorrow. This may sound like some futuristic fantasy, but the highway lobby has found powerful allies in the computer and information industries. 90% of federal funding for transportation research now goes to intelligent vehicle projects. If this cyber scheme ever becomes reality, it will cost some $200 billion. If Alfred Sloan were alive today, he'd love Los Angeles. With the old rail lines gone, more people drive cars here than anywhere else in America. Those who don't depend on a badly overburdened bus system. Transportation is an issue, especially in our community. We know that 90% of the ridership on the buses are low-income residents the job centers get further and further away from where we live. And because the lack of services in our community, we have to go so far to get groceries. It's so crowded at times, the bus pass people by. It's been many times I've been at the bus stop and two or three of the buses pass me by that I walk back home and call someone for a ride. It's just not a, a good system at all. All over America, public transit is in crisis. Federal operating support, an important piece of every system's budget, has been sliced practically in half. At the same time, highway funding continues to grow. Philadelphia is one city that's been badly hurt. This proposal is the most comprehensive cutback that we can ever recall being proposed. I drive 15 miles to the Parksburg train station and if that station is closed, I'm not driving 30 miles to the next closest train station. Our backs are to the wall. We've had to cut 10% out of our budget, $65 million. We've squeezed in every possible direction, and we're really down to the very last resort. I don't want to do it. I think it's a terrible mistake, and I think we'll pay a dear price later for it. One of the many cuts the city has had to make, four trolley lines have been terminated. Philly has worked hard to hold on to the streetcars left by National City, but now the ghosts of General Motors and the Fitzgeralds may finally have their way. The shop will be closed. The plug is pulled and it's only a matter of two more weeks and we'll be, we'll be out of business. And then they gave us two weeks to actually get rid of everything and shut the place down. 2091 was brought in today for uh, an inspection. 
You doing the inspection? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we're running streetcars until the 12th of September. And my job is to maintain those streetcars in a safe manner until the 12th of September. And uh, on, <clears throat> on the 11th of September, I'll be inspecting streetcars. Well, they're saying that in three years, they're going to put back on the track these cars. Well, if you believe that, then you believe Chrysler's going to bring back the DeSoto. And I don't think they are. cut back service, you lose passengers, you lose revenue, uh, you lose the confidence of your ridership that you can be effective and meet their needs. This is happening all over the country. Over half of the transit operators are needing to either raise fares, cut service, or do both. I would like to give people a choice. I'd like them to be able to have their automobiles. I'd like them to also be able to have a meaningful choice in the use of transit. And they don't have that choice right now. The only good transportation you can have in cities, in modern cities, is the one that combines public transportation, private transportation, which treats pedestrians decently and uses often bicycles and has a diversity of modes. When everybody drives, the system collapses. When cities get to the point where you have nothing but, but stop and crawl, stop and crawl traffic, Obviously, there isn't going to be any urban delight. There isn't going to be delight of, of the things that make a city what it is. And therefore, mass transit has to be continued, improved, and expanded. It's vital to the health of the city. It's vital to the beauty of the city. It's vital to the quality of life that the city has. We're here early in the first step of a long-term campaign to bring mass transit and public transit to the public. <laughs> We've had quite a few demonstrations at the Board of Supervisors. In fact, one of the meetings had more than a thousand people at it. You know, if nobody's talking, if nobody's saying anything, then people may think, oh, well, it's something that will blow over. It's something we can't change. But if people begin to think about it, people begin to talk about it, then they think they can change it. And that's where we make a difference, I think. This is a critical moment critical moment. I would say in the next five years, these five years will determine whether there will be a viable transit systems in over half of the areas of this country.